I want to welcome you once again to worship with us. Let's have, a, let's have a word of prayer before we open up the word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak for you. Anoint my tongue. Change, some, change anything that you need to change. And I pray that you prepare the hearts and minds of everybody here for the message that you would like to share with them. In Jesus' name we pray. We ask and we thank you. Amen. So I want to welcome you once again. And um, in preparation for my sermon, because life was happening and happening fast, I had to pause and take a moment and ask God what he would like me to speak on. Last Sunday, I was reminded of a dream I had just had. On occasion, God gives me dreams, but I, I don't always understand the meaning because I think God wants me to take the time to really talk to him in a deep and personal level and observe how he's taking care of things in my life. He also wants me to study the words some more to find the meaning of the symbols because they're not always clear until I compare them with God's word. And the Bible says in Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So I wouldn't want to do that. Anyway, I had this dream where I'm on a rock and I'm just sitting there. The rock is smooth and slippery and there are two cliffs below it. The one to my right is about a mile down. So if I jump in that direction, I'm not going to make it. If I jump down right in front of me, the cliff is about two stories down. So I would technically make it, but I would get severely hurt. Now, way to my left and about 20 feet ahead, there's an easy way to get down. All I'd have to do is take a step down into safety. But getting there would be kind of tricky. With the last option, I would have to step onto the foothold below me to climb onto the rock beside me. I just have to get onto that rock. The rock is really sturdy and wide, and it feels really safe. Once I get onto it, it would be hard to fall. I would have to purposely go in the wrong direction and then jump off. Once I'm on that solid rock, all I have to do is follow the path that leads to a, a safe step right onto the ground. Now, when you're, when you're rock climbing, a foothold is a little tiny piece of rock that supports your foot when you're, climb, when you're climbing. But those rocks, they're very, very small. And you have to be in fantastic shape in order to pull yourself up onto the next level. But the foothold does not look very promising, and I'm way out of, way out of shape. I wanted to cry, but instead I just sat there, frozen, in fear. Suddenly I wake up and I'm like, oh, this is my sermon. I didn't understand what it meant completely, but like I said, God likes for me to pray and recall other times when he's spoken to me and when, he, when I've studied his word. Now, I'm going to put a pin on the dream. We'll get back to that. But first, I'd like us to open up our Bibles to Proverbs 14, 12. And I only have four PowerPoint slides today because I want us to use our Bibles. You have Bibles in the pews in front of you, or you can use your phone apps. You can, yeah, okay. We're going to go to Proverbs 14, 12. It's page 873. In fact, I'm going to look for it with you. 873. Here we go. Okay, 874 is verse 12. It says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. That's the NIV version. I'll be reading from that today because that's the Bible version that, like I said, that you have in front of you in the pews. And I'd like to do something a little bit different today. I'd like for us to read together from 
all of Proverbs 14, the whole thing. I'm going to read it out out loud, and you guys are just going to follow along with me, okay? And the reason I'm doing this is because when you're studying a passage or a verse, you need to know what's written before that verse and what's written after the verse in order to completely understand the context. This is called contextual Bible study, meaning understanding the verse in its intended context versus applying an out-of-context meaning to the verse, okay? So grab the, po- grab the Bible in the pew in front of you, and let's read. Raise your Bibles when you find it. Page 873. Let's start with verse 1, where it says, The wise woman. Okay. The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears hers down. He whose walk is upright fears the Lord, but he whose ways are devious despises him. A fool's talk brings a rod to his back, but the lips of the wise protect them. Where there are no oxen, the manger is empty, but from the strength of an ox comes an abundant harvest. A truthful witness does not deceive. But a false witness pours out lies. The mocker seeks wisdom and finds none. But knowledge comes easily to the discerning. Stay away from a foolish man, for you will not find knowledge on his lips. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways. But the folly of fools is deception. Fools mock at making amends for sin. But goodwill is found among the upright. Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Even in laughter, the heart may ache, and joy may end in grief. The faithless will be fully repaid for their ways, and the good man rewarded for his. A simple man believes anything, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. A wise man fears the Lord and shuns evil, but a fool is hot-headed and reckless. A quick-tempered man does foolish things, and a crafty man is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Evil men will bow down in the presence of the good, and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The poor are shunned even by their neighbors, but the rich have many friends. He who despises his neighbor sins, but blessed is he who is kind to the needy. Do not those who plot evil go astray? But those who plan what is good find love and faithfulness. All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. The wealth of the wise is their crown, but the folly of fools yields folly. A truthful witness saves lives, but a false witness is deceitful. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a man from the snares of death. A large population is a king's glory, but without subjects, a prince is ruined. A patient man has great understanding, but a quick-tempered man displays folly. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. When calamity comes, the wicked are brought down, but even in death, the righteous have a refuge. 
Wisdom reposes in the heart of the discerning, and even among fools she lets herself be known. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. A king delights in a wise servant, but a a shameful servant incurs his wrath. So we're talking about foolishness and wisdom here. I'm sure that each one of you, like me, found that they can relate to something in this passage. Because we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of giving God the glory that he deserves through our own foolish actions. But God is so good and so forgiving. He wants to pour his life into you and into me. And that is why we are here, friends. Today, I'm going to focus on Proverbs 14, 12. In the King James Version, it says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So let's break this down and get deep, okay? I'm going to go Hebrew on you. Because that's the original language that the Old Testament was written in. Okay? So look, let's go to the next slide. And um, perfect. The reason I'm doing this is because I want you to understand the context. It's much deeper when you learn it in biblical Hebrew because the Hebrew language has a lot of meaning, especially in biblical Hebrew. They may use less words because each word is like a story, whereas English is very direct. In biblical Hebrew, one word can have several meanings depending on how it's used. For instance, if you use a preposition or a pronoun with a certain word, it can change the meaning. Or if you use two different words that have a similar meaning, it helps you to understand the context in which the author is trying to use it. Sometimes in biblical Hebrew, they also combine words to build a part of the story in that one combined word. In this passage, the Hebrew language uses eight words. In Hebrew, instead of reading from left to right, like we do in English, they read from right to left. So I'm going to start with that word that, the, that word that looks kind of like a W. Okay? I'm going to read very slowly. And if my pronunciation is bad, I want you to excuse me because it's been over 10 years since I've taken biblical Hebrew, okay? But it sounds something like this. Yesh berek yashar lipneish. Weacharita berek mavef. So, that little word from, from the other slide that looks like a W on the upper right, that's yish. I don't have time to tell you the whole story behind the word, but it means exists. Let's go on to the next slide now. And um, the context here is referring to human wisdom. The next word, which means, which is verek, means path. Word number three, yashar, which means straight, upright, upright, or quality, is referring to human wisdom in this passage as well. Lipne, lipne, is actually two words put together. Li is a preposition that means two, and the word pane means face. Together, it means to face um, to the face of, so to the face of, the context in this passage is referring to a human, to human wisdom, not a godly wisdom, and the excretion from a body part, which in this case is the face. And the, the excretion that comes out of your face is what? Is talking, yes, it's your words. So, Face can mean something good when it pertains to God's face because the light of God's countenance is his favor. But face can also signify anger, justice, or severity. To provoke God to his face is to sin against him openly. Ish means man. It refers to a person or any human. It's just a human. In this context, it means human-to-human wisdom as well. And we already learned that human-to-human wisdom 
is sinning openly, which is the same as provoking God to his face. Wea harita means both and her, or both their ends, or and the end of human wisdom, because this combination of words put together like a conjunction refers to human wisdom once again. Derek means path. The use of this word as well is referring to human wisdom, which is basically what? What is human wisdom? Is the opposite of wise. Foolish. So we can say the path of a foolish person. And just for a moment, I'd like to cross-reference the New Testament in Matthew 7, 13 to 14, where Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Maveth, the final word in this verse, um, it means death. I did an exegesis. In a theological sense, the definition of exegesis is an approach to interpreting Bible passages utilizing critical analysis. The word itself comes from a Greek word, which means to lead out of. It is the thorough investigation of biblical texts within their various contexts to discover the original intent of a word. Quoted word for word after exegesis, it would sound something like this if directly translated into English. It's a, a little bit rough because like I said, there's a story in each word. Um, I'll clarify it for you. Exi but it would sound like this. Exists path straight and upright to face of human to human wisdom. And the end of human wisdom path death. In other words, there exists an upright and righteous path according to human wisdom that includes open sin, which is provoking God to his face. All these foolish paths will end in death. When humans look to each other for wisdom rather than God, it can be very dangerous to their spiritual life unless that other person is completely and utterly committed to following God. Yes, God, he is forgiving, so forgiving. He wants to give you his loving mercy, but he also wants you to be willing to change. Christ says, come as you are, but be prepared to change, to be as he is. And that takes a lifetime. Now, going back to my dream that I started with, the rock that I was trying to get on, as well as the rock I was sitting on, represents Jesus, the rock of my salvation. I'll quote um, Psalm 62, 1-2. I like the New King James Version for this one. Truly, my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation, he is my only rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. As I was developing this morning's message, the Holy Spirit explained to me more of the meaning of this dream. I pictured myself there on the rock. I was frozen in fear trying to figure it out. How am I going to get down from here safely? It seemed impossible. The fear itself kept me from pausing and praying and allowing the Lord to help me get onto the right path. I sat waiting on God. It was good that I didn't remove myself from the rock. But the Holy Spirit was clearly showing me that more often than not, I try to figure out things on my own. I get overwhelmed by the challenges that life brings, and all I have to do is pause and take a moment and ask my Heavenly Father for help and wisdom. Of course, I would have never jumped off to the right and killed myself, 
But if I had tried doing it on my own, I would have fallen and gotten severely hurt on the way down. God would have happily helped me get onto that rock if I had just asked him. There exists a, a life path that seems upright and straight to the foolish, but it ends in death. Friends, we cannot do it alone. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It can be very scary because you can't do it by yourself. You can't. I, I'm, I'm so tired. I get so exhausted. I'm frustrated. I don't want to be tired anymore. But we have three choices. We can be cold, hot, or lukewarm for God. In the book of Revelation which is the revelation of Jesus Christ to us. He tells us through John. He wrote, uh, he says, John, write the following to the angel of the church in Laodicea, Revelation 3, verses 15 to 17. It says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Those who are cold may have chosen to completely live outside of God's will. They don't go to church or call themselves Christians. They've either completely given up on God or they don't know anything about him. If they don't go to heaven, they don't care because they don't want it. They don't want it anyway. They don't want to. They've never or they've never heard of it. Their relationship with God is not existent. But there's hope because they might fall in love with Jesus one day when they know who he is. And Jesus can raise them up from the spiritual death because that's what Jesus does. He raises the dead and he brings them back to life. The lukewarm Christian knows about God and goes to church and pretends to be a Christian, but they're flirting with sin or with darkness. They want to be saved. But they also want to play with sin because it feels too good to stop or maybe it's just comfortable. The lukewarm might feel afraid to make a commitment to live completely in God's will. They may spend time with him when it's convenient or to just check off the boxes. But they may, they may want to be accepted by others too. So if most people are doing something in, in their heart that they know is wrong, they try to justify it because they don't want to they don't want to be wrong, or they don't want to feel wrong, or look like the weird one, or lose their friends, or even their family, in some very severe cases. Others may not really care about what others think, but they're not completely ready to give up on their cherished sins. They've consciously chosen, or, or unconsciously, to not live out the Christianity of the Bible, which tells us in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. They may really like God, but only when it's convenient. They're not passionately in love with him. Even though some may feel like they are, they are, it's a feeling that comes and goes based on their emotions rather than a personal relationship with Jesus. The hot Christian represents the people who really want to live for God. These are the people whose hearts belong to God. They've completely fallen in love with him, and they're dependent on him. They have their ups and downs, yes, but when they fall, they are so sorry because they love their Jesus. Just like you, when you love your, your kids or your husband or your, whoever you're really close to, when you do something to hurt them, you are so sorry because you love them and you don't want to hurt them. Now, without a daily intimate relationship with God, without abiding in him, it's impossible to be truly sorry for our cherished sins and to please him. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven five 5 to 6, 
By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Enoch was a righteous man, brothers and sisters. He was so righteous and so transformed that God took him to heaven without even seeing death. Can you imagine? Romans 10, 17. I like the NKJV, the New King James Version for this. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So to be able to handle the temptations in this world, the hot Christian takes time to listen to their dear Savior and read his word. They've made it their priority. They abide with their Jesus to gain strength and wisdom in how to handle their day. They study each passage and absorb each and every word because they're hungry and it's satisfying that hunger and that thirst for righteousness, asking God for wisdom and understanding. They may even journal, but every day they, go, they involve God in their they involve God in their plans, no matter what it is. They keep getting closer and closer to God, so they're falling in love with Him, and as a result, they're being transformed into the image of Jesus, because by beholding Him, family, we will become changed. They want to be better, so they ask God for help in following the right path to righteousness. They may fall into sin, but it's not intentional. And when they do, they are truly sorry. Friends, family, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Like Pastor Gary mentioned in his sermon a few weeks ago, referencing activities that we would engage in if Jesus was standing right next to us or hanging out with us for a day. What would that experience be like for you and for me? This message hit home for me. I need to involve God more in my day. I don't get it right all the time. I don't. And I feel so terrible that I become overwhelmed and sad and anxious. But God is like, Lynette, or Julie, or Jean, or Michael, put your name there. Take a moment. Pause. Stop focusing on yourself. Come, follow me. We need to involve our Heavenly Father in every aspect of our life. We cannot work towards the perfection of Christ on our own. We need his help. We have to prepare ourselves and open our hearts to be changed, to be prepared to go through that purification of character that our sinful nature resists on a daily basis. Maybe maybe you're on the other side of lukewarm. You live a pretty good life according to human to human wisdom anyway, but that's not God's wisdom. What is it according to God? Because the Bible says that human righteousness is like filthy rags. You're not excited about God anymore. You don't spend much quality time with him, but you're trying to be perfect on your own. Some of you are so tired that you're thinking about giving up on God altogether. That's what the enemy wants. Don't give him what he wants. Don't let the enemy of souls toy with you because that is what he's doing. He doesn't care about you, but Christ adores you. He died for you. 
he already paid the price for your sins and your shortcomings, which is death, so that you can have the gift of eternal life. Our Heavenly Father, our Daddy God, because he's your daddy, not just your Heavenly Father, he is your daddy. He would like for us to consecrate ourselves to him every day because that's how often the enemy is after your soul every minute of every day he wants us to allow him to take over our lives so he can shepherd us to eternal life he died that we might have eternal life let that sink in But he will not force himself. He is a gentleman. He needs to be invited. Who wants to take a step and recommit their lives to Jesus Christ today? Who wants to step into a renewed or a brand new relationship with God today? Committing your heart committing your mind to him, trusting him to help you to become the best version of who he created you to be, who is ready to trust God wholly and completely. And he created you for eternal life, by the way. We're not meant to die. It's easy. God made it easy. All you have to do is spend time with him. Make him your best friend. Make him your priority. If he didn't want you to have eternal life, you wouldn't be here right now. If you want to do that today, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to listen. And I want you to have a silent conversation with God. While Cindy and Haziel sing the closing song. And then... We'll pray for you after.